This is quite a story. For those of you who remember World War II, it was a fella called the Sad Stack. No matter what, what he did, gloom and doom would follow him everywhere. Unfortunately, that sort of relates to our little friend here, the Eagle Bus. She, uh, she had a hard time in life. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow that story. I'm not a tremendous historian, so there may be a few errors here and there. I'm just relating a lot of things from recall and first person as I was a photographer for Eagle for quite a few years until up towards the end. But no matter how you look at it, if it spurs you on to dig further, you're still going to, you're, you're going to enjoy it. It's a very unique car. And without further ado, let's see where Eagle come from. We haven't got to go back right to the beginning when buses were actually just stretched out automobiles. Never in the history of the United States was an, an industry that had such a meteoric rise as the bus industry. Right from the start, they were off and running. And it wasn't very long at all. Little Stretch Automobile, the Little Jitney, would very, very shortly become something more exotic, looking like this. Of course, the entrepreneurs would get on board. These would, uh, would evolve. Scheduling would get more sophisticated. And all in all, they were, they were off and running. The need was there, and the public responded because the, the American passenger car had not yet taken the dominance that it has in this day and age. And consequently, as a result of these large companies forming, some of them formed amalgamations. The famous uh, short line amalgamation in the east, that was predominant, running well into the south. Travis's uh, famous Pioneer Yellowway system out west. Oh, there was a lot going on. But one thing was going on that attracted the attention of almost everybody that was in the bus industry coast to coast. And that was the creation of the Greyhound Lines. The Greyhound Lines was rapidly eating up carriers or else just plain old-fashioned running them out of business through fair structure and, and scheduling to the point that, as we said, everybody that wasn't a part of the Greyhound family was getting downright panic-struck. Greyhound even struck a deal with the famous Yellow Coach, which was then, uh, uh, as GM, General Motors Corporation had named their, uh, their bus manufacturing facility, they struck a deal with them for exclusive buses that nobody else could buy except Greyhound unless you had Greyhound's permission. Thus, in just a few short years, Greyhound had virtually eliminated the engine forward bus. They were running coast to coast. And by 1939, they had again revolutionized the look of buses. Uh, designing them after the famous stainless steel crack passenger railroad trains of the era, they created what was called the Silver Side. Now also the creation of the American inner city bus industry was being undertaken primarily by the railroads of the United States, including the creation of Greyhound. Now there were several carriers, and among them the more predominant being Missouri Pacific Railroad's Missouri Pacific coaches, the Santa Fe Trails of uh, the Santa Fe Railroad fame, creating a route structure all the way from the west coast to Chicago, along with the famous Burlington, uh, Burlington Railroad fame. So in 1936, to offset the vastly growing Greyhound system, Trailways, National Trailways bus system was incorporated. 
There were a lot of Eastern carriers, Frank Mart, Santa Rondack, and uh, one Western carrier in particular, and that was Boeing, Bowen coaches. Bowen, uh, under the direction of Moore, F. E. Moore, would become eventually the dominant trailway carrier that we knew at the end. However, at the close of the 30s, Greyhound was going great guns afire. They were incorporating all kinds of companies, such as Washington Motor Coach here, these very rare pictures of a yellow coach 743. Now, of course, Washington Motor Coach was just one of a myriad of, of people that were being gobbled up by the emerging Greyhound lines. And consequently, the Trailways people went to town, great guns of fire, trying to offset this onslaught. Greyhound brought out this brand new Silverside coach. Trailways had nothing like it. So it was always a sore spot in Trailways' side. The Greyhound had the money and the clout to be able to go to GM and do these unique things because Trailways, of course, was an amalgamation of small family-owned companies and, and they just didn't have the financial clout to be able to pull something like this off. The Trailway carriers would always be envious of Greyhound's position in the industry. Now, Emmy Moore, of course, uh, like all the rest of the carriers, particularly Emmy, during the time of the World War II, he was deep in the, in the middle of a million military bases and made a scathing amount of money, just like Greyhound did, and consequently bought out uh, many, many of the Texas carriers and ended up changing the name of, of Bowen Trailways to Continental Trailways. And, and probably we, the second most important acquisition ever was the Continental Trailway, I mean the Santa Fe Trailways. Overnight put him all the way from the West Coast into Mid-America, into Chicago. Here is a very rare picture, uh, an interim car, Santa Fe Trailways with the name Continental up at top, which would soon be the dominant, of course. Like most railway carriers at the close of World War II, uh, they would be a large stronghold of ACF Brills. That was, of course, until one little thing. That one little thing would be a bus that would really impact on how uh, buses would look from henceforth. Well, they did have the quote-unquote modernized silver-sided ACF grill. It wouldn't even begin to hold a candle to what GM was about to jump out and scene with. That was, of course, none other than the famous 4104 Air Ride, shown here in Missouri Pacific uh, bus lines. Moore would buy Missouri Pacific and help strengthen his inner gut work in uh, Middle America. His inner route structure would grow immensely with the acquisition of Missouri. Thus, Missouri Pacific Trailways, which was one of the creators of the original Trailways group, then dropped out, would now again be back in Trailways, but underneath the Continental masthead, of course. Now you remember Burlington Trailways. Well, Burlington Trailways was bought out by a carrier called American Bus Lines. American Bus Lines operated coast to coast. They had old uh, granddaddy rights, and oh well, they operated mostly closed door. Intrastate was denied to them almost every state they operated in. They could haul passengers interstate, but the fact remains the golden key was that they had coast to coast rights. Thus, Burlington was swallowed up by American bus lines. It wasn't very long after American bus lines bought Burlington. Uh, here's an interim shot in itself, uh, somewhat rare. Burlington and, and American were, were big uh, Burl operators as well. So, more got it, and all the ABL cars would become now part of the Continental system. 
and more would have a true coast-to-coast -coast bus line. He truly was now in a position of real power. Greyhound knew of his existence, to say the least. Everything was done to try and hurt the red bus. But he hung on. Now that sale to America, that sale from American took place in 1954, which was about the same time that the uh, air ride came out. Continental, of course, jumped on board this because if you didn't have these, your fleet was immediately dated because of the big giant uh, picture windows on the side. Of course, the other neat thing being uh, the fact that at the moment, that happened to have been Greyhound's prime piece of equipment, too. So now Greyhound and Trailways were equal as far as equipment went. Naturally, it, it, it went without saying that Greyhound was immensely perturbed at the fact that uh, Trailways was running the same quote-unquote air ride uh, that they were. But you have to remember, this was the first coach, inner-city coach that rode on air, air suspension, and dubbed as being a limousine smooth ride, which maybe was stretching the point of might. Thus, the incredible Greyhound air ride would give birth to something entirely different, something the bus industry has never before seen. The incredible Greyhound scenic cruiser PD4501 was born. And this is 001 P5446 of Pennsylvania Greyhound Lines. And did it impact the bus industry. It was awesome. Emmy Moore just stood there as a whole bunch of other folks did with their mouth wide open. Actually, it was a design that was created back in the, in the late 20s. However, people actually left their cars home to ride this coach. There's no question about it. And Emmy was really desperate now. He knew that he had to have something. Well, they went to their old friends at ACF Brill. ACF Brill said, uh, yeah, sure, we can make a deck and a half. Of course, they made it 35 feet. Nor did they bother to tell uh, Continental that they would soon be closing their doors anyhow. So one off, that's all that ever existed of this car. The deck and a half ACF Brill was made. Here it is in later years in Penn Jersey Coachways colors. So where that didn't work out too good, C.D. Beck said, well, ah, we can make some buses for your deck and a halves. And the C.D. Beck company, which was located in Sydney, Ohio, created this. Again, it was a 35 footer. However, Unlike ACF Brill, who was just about ready to leave the bus building business, Ebeck did turn their car into a 40-footer. However, Moore and the boys at Continental, uh, while well, Queen City owned a percentage of C.D. Beck, created both versions of the car, the 35-foot as well as the 40. Uh, the boys at Continental decided, uh-uh. Car's not very well built, very frail, has no longevity to it. We don't want it. But in the meantime, Flexible came out with one, imitation deck and a half. The only problem, again, it was 35 footer. However, this car was made substantially better than the Beck was. And the car was bought in limited numbers. From any angle, it was a good looker, but unfortunately, it lacked that absolutely wonderful thing that buses, inner city buses, have to have, and that's baggage bays. Big baggage bays for Package Express as well as people's belongings. In the meantime, Moore saw some things that were being done across the pond in Europe that somewhat got his attention. So, to a German bus builder by the name of Kasbora, he went hat in hand and said, can you help me? 
Thus, in 1956, for the incredible sum of $46,000, the Casbora Eagle would appear on the scene. She was sent to the United States. The original car was later numbered Fleet Number 1800, and she ran from Dallas to Houston uh, during her evaluation period. She had a, a man diesel engine. Now, Casbora, of course, was very thickly allied with man and uh, was not about to get involved with GMs. Although, at that particular time and period, GM was just finishing up the antitrust suit and uh, the engines were not readily available in the, in the first place. She also had initially uh, a ZF six speed transmission. They were later uh, regeared for five-speed boxes. Very, very, very difficult transmission the ZF was. It would get wet, it wouldn't function. As a matter of fact, the whole man ZF arrangement was not exactly to uh, Moore's likings, to say the least. The front windows, uh, the triple windows, didn't work out too terribly well either. They leaked horrendously particularly the middle one. It would be like a Chinese water torture on the drivers. I know quite a few drivers who drove this car and her sisters, and they hated it with a passion. We were embark upon a huge advertising campaign and uh, try to go up against the Cena Cruiser. It did with a, a, a little success. Now, have you noticed the very first Eagle the not series one eagle but the very first eagle serial number zero zero one see the little air uh, intake down there by the the Casbora emblem it had square corners well the production cars would not have the square corners they would their corners of that little grill down there would be rounded off she said uh, she was shown off in all the predominant cities throughout the system including uh, San Francisco shown here, generally in the, in the heart of the city where lunchtime uh, crowds would, would be uh, predominant. Important personages of the day would be, uh, would be utilized, such as back in these days, uh, in the mid-50s, Art, Link, Art Linklet, it was a, he was a household word uh, in uh, the field of television. The interior of the car was rather unique. It even had an aft uh, solar recreation area. Well, the solar recreation area didn't work out too terribly well. Not only did that also leak, it got darn warm back there when, uh, when you were in hot climates. It, of course, uh, was in some ways uh, unique in, in the fact that it it sort of promised the fact that you could get up and walk around in the bus, uh, much like a, a Pullman train. It was bulkheaded off from the, uh, the rest of the passenger cabin, again, for the, the, to try and create that uh, cylinder effect in there. The lab was back over the right tag axle, I believe. Let me, let me think now. I've got to remember this one. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was back over the right tag axle, and opposite the gas, the the uh, the lab was a was a mini galley that didn't serve much more than sandwiches and, and, and drinks and some coffee. Now, in another attempt to offset the Greyhound uh, competition, Emmy Moore created back, matter of fact, as far back as the IC41 Brills. The, uh, the famous five-star uh, service with hostess equipped uh, as seen here in this picture with number 2504 one of the original mustached uh, 1956 uh, and 57 eagles well this one is definitely a 56 because if you notice that front windshield that was later redesigned oh, that's no, that's one of the ones with the redesign you remember how the first car that wrapped over the top 
well, they, they dropped it down so that if it leaked, it didn't leak directly onto the driver. 1958, they, uh, they redesigned the car again. As you notice now, the little grill down the bottom has been lengthened and uh, also uh, rounded, as we, we said earlier. And instead of the three Z-bolts in the early 57 cars, it now had a single Z-bolt. Again, this is still being Cetra. And the big, thick, uh, painted wheel well uh, fenders, if you wanted to call them fenders. I don't think you could actually really call them fenders. 6804. 6804 was announcing the uh, the first luxury uh, service with the Golden Eagle uh, stewardesses aboard. They had a little paper sign on the side of it going through her paces here in this series of pictures. As we said, the original cars were had gold anodization on the, where the silver siding was. Henry Moore was a happy camper now. The car had uh, torso elastic springing, which was very similar uh, to the the uh, flexible Vista liner. Although its major, believe it or not, its major frame construction construction technique was brought over from the mighty Aero Coach. As a matter of fact, Emmy Moore had some folks from uh, Aero Coach as, as consulting engineers. This would be even further brought out later on down the road. Not so much at, at Casbora. But the idea, the mighty eagle was here. She was here to stay. With just these little modifications being done, and the, the modifications that were primarily done when they were closing in that aft sun deck and the redesigning that overhead windshield and, of course, the destination sign. And a load of various uh, technical, mechanical things which I'm not that awfully sharp on, so I shouldn't really get into too easily. In 57, Moore was really flying. Uh, he was pretty well impressed with what was going on and bought two of these 60-foot articulated uh, Casporas, dubbed the Academy Express. It was a flagrant waste of company money and definitely, definitely an ego trip. The cars had no air conditioning. They had absolutely no baggage space. And what was worse is they couldn't run anywhere except Colorado and with special permits in California. Thus, the cars ended up running between Colorado Springs, Pueblo, and Denver in the Rocky Mountain Division. But as if he didn't learn enough from buying the Academy cars, well, what can you say? He had to go and make five Golden Eagles. Of the 01 variety. Unbelievable, but he did it anyhow. If they could make a thing like the Academy Express, and they had the articulation down to a science, then they could make one of his Golden Eagles could be made just as easily. Here she is with her five-star eagle emblem on her. She was fleet, this particular one here was fleet number 4901. Now the Academy cars were, were, were sold off. And I saw one alongside a church down in Houston a long time ago. Thus, they weren't very long lived on the, on the system, particularly the academies. IBC or Max Sheasley found one down in Phoenix. Uh, it's kind of a sad end for her, but what she was is she was turned into a, a horse van of sorts, I guess. 
you can plainly see here that the back dropped down they trucked horses in there now the one that was still a seated bus I saw alongside the church in Houston I don't know whether that's still sitting in a Houston junkyard or not to tell you the truth I have no idea some of the other articulateds the Golden Eagle articulateds at least went to AC Transit in the Bay Area became the famous commuter buses ran around San Francisco for quite a spell after that stint they'd end up also as entertainers coaches with one actually being uh, the back track of being shot and even another five feet and the surprise of surprises at the bus bash in Salem Massachusetts alongside the one-of-a-kind Mac Peter Wilson sort of slandered up with this she's one of the AC cars and today is perhaps the most incredible I mean the most incredible restored bus that's in existence on the planet want to take a look at her